guys, what's up? Welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Natalie and I make golf lifestyle videos. Today's video is a little bit different. Um, for those of you that don't know, I've been a PhD student the last three years. And as of today, July 20th, 2020, I am Dr. Natalie Bird. Um, it still feels so weird to say. I It's gonna be a while before I'm used to that. But anyway, um, this video that you're watching now is actually my dissertation defense. So that's a fancy way of saying this is when I presented my dissertation um, to my committee. This is what I gave them, told them all about my research, and then um, what they decided that I could be Dr. Bird based on. The reason I decided to upload this on my channel is because I make golf lifestyle content. Most of you guys are golfers. Um, so I think a lot of you guys would find this interesting. If you know anything about Brooks Kepka in the 2018 Ryder Cup when he struck a woman in the face with a golf ball, actually in the eye, her eye exploded. Um, anyway, if you found that interesting or knew anything about it when it was happening, um, you may actually really like this because that was kind of the inspiration for my entire dissertation. Anyway, I thought you guys might like it. Um, it's the first study that's ever been done like this before, ever, um, within academia and also within the industry that I know of. Um, so hopefully it's something that you would enjoy, find interesting, and um, yeah. If you have any questions or want to know more about any of this, leave a comment down below, um, but we'll jump into it. With that, we are here for the doctoral defense of Natalie Bird, and her dissertation is on golf buffer zones, and with that, I turn it over to Natalie for presentation. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to thank all of you guys for being here today. Um, this is obviously a very big day and I appreciate you taking time out of your day um, to come and watch and hear about the research that I've done. Um, so I'm actually going to hop right into it. I'm going to share um, my PowerPoint with you guys so you can see everything. Um, so just give me a moment. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about buffer zones and how they relate to golf. And the title of my dissertation is Buffer Zones and the Recreational Golf Sector, a Negligence Case Content Analysis. Um, I wanted to also take a moment and just ask you to silence your microphones. I think most of you guys already are, um, especially some of the people. I know I'm still getting people that come in. Um, just to remind everybody, just to make sure that um, you guys can hear me and obviously that way um, I can answer everybody's questions at the very end of the presentation. Okay, so we're going to start with a brief introduction. Now for the sake of time, I'm not going to go super in depth in both of my introduction and my literature review. Um, I'm just going to give you some of the background information that I think will be beneficial for you to understand the problem that I'm going to be talking about. So the first thing that I want to address is why buffer zones? Why does, did I decide to study any of this stuff? Now I will say, um, I will tell you what buffer zones are and we'll discuss that more in depth, but I wanna share with you kind of my inspiration for even starting any of this. So it all started with the 2018 Ryder Cup, which was over in France. And this was a particularly interesting event because of this guy, Brooks Kepka. He, at the time of the event was number one in the world he ended up striking Kareen Remand in the eye during one of the matches of the tournament. Now, this is something that happens all the time. Um, some articles that I read said this happens every single week at a tour event. It's pretty much unavoidable. Um, but this one, this particular instance was really important and really um, part of the the public eye more so than some of the others because from the get-go this woman is saying that she is going to sue tournament directors she's going to sue people at the Ryder cup um, because of her injuries so these are just a couple of the headlines that started coming up 
Now, normally when people get hit at golf tournaments, um, you know, usually they have injury and then it's usually not something that's picked up by the media or if it is, it's very brief. But this lady, she really said, hey, this is a problem. I'm, I lost sight in my eye and I'm going to sue. And so whenever all of this happened and I started to see these headlines, it kind of sparked my interest because I study risk management and law and obviously golf is a big part of my life. I played in college and it's pretty much all of my research. So it kind of got those wheels spinning in my mind. Now, again, before I talk about what a buffer zone is, I'm giving you a little bit of the background. It may seem like it's a little bit backwards, but I promise it will all make, make sense. So the theoretical framework that guided this research was Smilly and Blissett's model for risk communication strategy. Now, as you can see, this is made up of three different stages. And the first stage is risk appraisal. So this is an objective overview of the scientific facts. And for me personally, for this study, um, this is going to be my review of literature. That's what's going to be stage one. Now stage two, this is a situational analysis. So this is kind of looking at the likely perceived risk through the lens of the outside world. And for my um, study, for the purpose of this, would be my case content analysis. And I'll get into what exactly this looks like and how I did that. But basically, you can look at this as um, the situation that I was trying to analyze. I was doing so through a case content analysis. And then stage three is a source analysis. This is the responsible communicator undertakes an element of self-analysis in relation to the risk. Now, I'm adapting this a little bit because I am using an analysis of the golf industry when talking about the buffer zone issue. So rather than me talking as an individual myself, my self-analysis, I'm going to be talking about the industry as a whole, uh, mainly because I am part of that industry and also because it's going to be the most transferable. It's going to provide the most information. So hopefully this paints a picture as to kind of how my thought process got started with not only why I looked into buffer zones, but also kind of my thinking behind my process. So I have three research questions that guided this research. And the first is where do most golf ball injuries occur? We hear of people getting hit all the time, but where exactly do they occur? Now, I don't mean where in the world or at what events, but just basically, where do they occur? If they're going to happen at a golf course or in that um, atmosphere, where exactly does that happen? Also, what is the proximate cause of damages resulting from errant golf shots? So what exactly causes the damages or the injuries? Um, obviously, we can say it's the errant golf ball, but what circumstances surround that? And then lastly, what injuries and damages are the result of errant golf shots? So big picture, we're looking at where do these injuries happen? What exactly are these injuries? And what are the damages, the problems, the injuries that um, are a result of these issues? So like I said, I'm gonna do a brief review of literature just to provide a little bit more context. And first off, I'm gonna tell you about risk management. Now, risk management is really important um, because this is not an effort to remove all risk. It's really important to consider to be able to protect people, but you are not trying to make everything um, so safe that you can't enjoy the activity. That's not the purpose of risk management. It purely is a process that will help minimize loss. Now, usually in this context or just in risk management in general, we're talking about loss in financial, um, in, in finances and money. So if we're talking about um, lawsuits, obviously that costs a lot of money. Those can be extremely damaging for an organization. So risk management is really important to avoid those losses. And buffer zones fall into the category of risk management. Um, one of the sources that I quoted a lot in my dissertation said it perfectly. One can drastically reduce the likelihood of participant injuries and subsequent lawsuits by providing ample buffer zones. So now you may be wondering, okay, you've said all this stuff about buffer zones, you've talked about this, but what exactly is it? 
A buffer zone is a certain amount of space between an activity area and any obstructions to enhance the safety of participants. So I have this graphic here. You can see this is a basketball court. The green area around the court is what is called the buffer zone. This is what we're talking about. Um, we are talking about it through the context of golf, but basketball um, is really easy to understand generally what this means. So a buffer zone is really important because practitioners, they bear the legal duty to provide reasonably safe conditions. And those safe conditions aren't just for um, the people participating actively in the sport or the activity. This also can be um, those that are passively participating. So people that are just watching, spectators, um, even just staff at an event. And practice, practitioners bear the legal duty to provide safe conditions and buffer zones are part of that. And insufficient buffer zones breach that duty. So here's another picture you can see um, the area that is not shaded out. That is a buffer zone. So the end of the activity area is right on that line that dictates where the, co the court is and then where the actual spectators sit. That area in between, that is the buffer zone. That's kind of what we're looking at here. So buffer zones, however, are not a one size fits all approach. So um, I showed you guys the, the pictures of the basketball court, but obviously a basketball court and a golf course are totally different things. All sports are unique and that's because they have different rules, different equipment, different physical demands, different participants. And also there are no buffer zone standards that currently exist for any sector of the golf industry. So I want us to look at this big picture and think every sport is completely different, especially if you, again, compare basketball to golf. Um, it's very hard to compare those in general, other than that there is a ball involved. Um, so the buffer zones are not gonna be the same. I showed you guys some pictures of buffer zones in basketball courts. And the reason I don't have any pictures for golf courses is because that doesn't really exist. There are no standards that currently exist. And we'll dive into that a little bit more. So other sports are starting to prioritize buffer zones. Like I said, you've already seen basketball courts. Um, 10 feet is recommended by most of the governing bodies within basketball. Um, and then we also have what is called the baseball rule. Um, essentially, the baseball rule is saying that anyone that is sitting behind the netting at like an MLB stadium, the netting that goes, um, I don't know how, what percentage of the, um, the field is surrounded by netting because it's different at every single field. But basically, the people that are outside of that netted area, they are assuming the risk of sitting out there. So basically, if they're sitting outside of that netting, they're saying, hey, I may get hit, but that's cool. I'm accepting that they, that may happen by sitting here. So the netting is kind of similar. We're looking at the same kind of thing. Um, as far as buffer zones go. But being struck by a golf ball accounts for 16% of all golf related injuries. This seems like a small number. However, when we're talking about all golf related injuries, we're talking about everything from somebody hurting their back, um, somebody hurting their wrist, tripping and falling, rolling their ankle. Um, so being struck by a golf ball is actually pretty significant because in a lot of ways it's out of the control of the golfer. Um, whereas some of the other things, you know, if somebody rolls their ankle, it's totally different. Usually that's going to be something that the golfer does to themselves. Whereas getting struck by a golf ball obviously is almost always completely out of your control. So I already mentioned some of these other sports, the governing bodies around these sports are coming up with these either standards, these recommendations for buffer zones, but golf is completely different. Um, golf is also really interesting in that governing bodies, they provide little guidance for safety in general for courses. And we're talking about like the USGA, the PGA, um, the American Society of Golf Course Architects, these people don't really provide anything that practitioners can use other than there's some vague statements like, make sure there are no blind tee shots. Okay, but what exactly does that mean? Um, none of this really exists within golf. 
And part of this is also norms and facility types are inf influential when dealing with this problem. One of the areas I really dove into in my literature review is um, experience of golfers as well as norms and safety and being able to perceive the risk um, and the type of golf facilities. Those things all kind of go into buffer zones and I'll explain that a little bit more here in a minute. Um, but I wanted to mention this now because I chose to focus on the recreational sector because this, um, this shows basically the largest group of people. Um, because a private golf course is just like it sounds. It's private, there's a, an exclusive group of people that are able to play there. Public, just about anybody can play. Um, recreational usually encompasses both. So you have a wide range of age, um, skill level, um, as well as different types of golf courses. All of these things play a part in buffer zones. It's not something that's black and white. There's a lot of gray area with this. So now that you guys have a little bit of an understanding of what buffer zones are, I'm gonna tell you about my study in particular and what I did. So what I decided to do was a case content analysis. And the reason I did this was because lawsuits identify situations and themes. By reading different lawsuits, I was able to see some of the recurring issues that came up within some of the scenarios in these lawsuits. Also, a content analysis is replicable and systematic. And it's a better way to read cases because it brings the rigor of social science to our understanding of case law. Um, whenever you're reading something according to a case content analysis, um, you are actually following a process. And I'll show you what I logged and how I did that. But it's not just me reading these cases and saying, I think that this is what happens. Um, there is a rigorous process. It is something that's actually, um, you know, it's more official, for lack of a better word, than me just giving my opinion. And it's considered valid if it measures relevant components of the case. And we'll talk about those components here in a moment. Um, and it can identify useful points of connection to facilitate understanding of the situation. And understanding of the situation in this context is buffer zones within the golf industry. So the way that I did this was I used Westlaw, which is a database. Um, I chose this database because it has a very strong reputation, both within the legal community and academia in general. And I used an advanced search option and I typed in golf and negligence in the all of these terms field. And then I selected the date range from January 1st, 1960 to December 31st of 2019. Um, that's roughly 60 years. And the reason that I chose 1960 is because um, the 60s was actually like a booming period for golf. And I think it's really important to look at some of the stuff that happened way back when golf was, you know, in many ways, totally different than how it is now, um, as far as society views golf. But I feel like it's important to look at um, issues that occurred then as well as now and put them all together because, um, you know, every aspect of any sport, de depending on when, um, when it came into existence and how it changed over the years, I think there's something that you can gather by looking at that. So that's why I chose to go back so far. And then I limited the search by entering ball or shot in the search with, within results field. So I was looking for a very specific type of case. This yielded 1,561 cases, which was 975 state cases and 586 federal cases. Now, this was um, tedious because each case had to be reviewed individually and irrelevant cases were removed. So examples of irrelevant cases were those that dealt with um, things like workers' compensation. Somebody got hit by a golf ball while they were working and they sued their employer. Um, that wasn't included. Um, also things like, um, you know, people being hit by um, a golf ball and then driving their golf cart into a lake and suing the golf course. Like it had to be specific to golf ball related injuries. And I'll talk about further how I limited that. 
So again, started with roughly 1500 cases. After I did that um, kind of tedious review, 133 cases were left. So I ended up with 133 cases that I was like, okay, these are focused on golf and buffer zones. These actually pertain to this issue. <clears throat> And then eventually it narrowed down even further to 85 cases because once I started looking into the buffer zones issues more, um, I was able to limit it down even more. And I'll talk about how I eventually got there. But so my final number was 85 cases as the final data set. Now, I wanna also mention that a case content analysis um, understands important considerations when determining if buffer zones are necessary. That's one of the things I was trying to do. And uh, ignore the rest of this. I'm sorry, I meant to eliminate this slide. Okay, so the case content analysis itself, I talked about how this was a rigorous process. Um, this is kind of a look at my spreadsheet. So I would read each case and then after I read and realized that um, it did pertain to what I was trying to study, I then, um, took note of all of these different um, categories or these different issues. So first the citation, the date, the search number, the reference, what was struck, the category, as well as the subcategory, a legal topic or topics that were discussed, the issue that was part of the case, as well as the decision. So I essentially logged this for that initial 133 cases. And after I was able to log all of this information, that was how I was able to narrow it down to 85. So now let's jump into results. The first thing that kind of came up whenever I was analyzing my data were there were three incident locations. They were, I decided to categorize them this way because I felt like it was the easiest way to understand the problem. And so I categorized them as first on course incidents. So these were incidents that occurred within nine holes or 18 holes, depending on how the golf course was laid out actually within the golf course. Also, there was off course. Um, these cases were um, anything that happened off the course. So any injury or property damage that was the result of something that happened on the golf course or the golf course premises. And then course premises. So these were incidents that happened on the property, but weren't within the confines of the golf course. So these are things like driving range, parking lot, putting green, that kind of thing. So once I divided those into those three categories, I started to notice some subcategories that emerged. Um, a lot of these are self explanatory. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. But the first is different whole different group. So incidents between people that were playing in different groups on different holes, residence property damage, vehicle property damage, injury at residence, patron, as well as parking lot, same hole, same group, same hole, different group, and maintenance. Now, one thing I do want to mention is the patron category. This is a very broad category, um, and this kind of encompasses all of the um, miscellaneous people that were injured in uh, kind of different circumstances that didn't fit cleanly in these other subcategories. So it's, um, it's a little bit different than the other categories, but it was necessary for me to kind of put them all together. And I'll talk about that here in a moment. But as I started to look through and comb through all of these subcategories, like I said, I had 133 cases, I was able to really look into this and I thought, the same whole same group um, category as well as the same whole different group category, those buffer zones didn't really necessarily um, provide any benefit in those situations. That was just another group hitting into another group. Um, that may be golf course design, but a buffer zone would not have helped that issue. Um, and same thing with maintenance. If somebody um, hits something that ricochets back at them, a buffer zone isn't necessarily going to provide anything to protect from that. So I have in, ended up eliminating those three subcategories in the final data set. So that's what got me to that number of 85. 
So here is a picture basically of the subcategory frequencies. You can see the different whole different group category was or sub subcategory rather was the biggest one. And that's just basically people were hitting other people that were on a different hole than them. That's the simplest way to define it. That was the most common issue that um, common circumstances, proximate cause of these damages and these injuries. Um, and you can see how the rest of them break down. Now it's no surprise to me that um, the on course issues were the most common and that the off course were the second most and then um, course premises was third. And you can see how they all break down. But I think that this is no surprise when you just think about how a golf course is in general and the activity that goes on there. So we're going to talk about these subcategories briefly. And for the sake of time, I am not going to um, you know, really dive deep into these. And I also want to say that I'm just focusing and telling you guys kind of the big themes that came out of these subcategories rather than focusing um, solely on each individual lawsuit and the, um, and the ruling and the decision. Because I'm sure you guys don't want to hear me talk about 85 different cases, especially I know I'm long winded anyway. So you probably don't want to hear me talk about that. So I'm going to talk about just briefly some of the emerging themes. Now the first different whole different group. This was the most common category most common type of incidents. And some of the things that we st started to see here was that a bad shot is not enough to prove negligence. Um, just like I showed you guys in the inspiration for doing this, um, Brooks Kepka was number one in the world and he hit someone. Um, so when you have a bunch of recreational golfers of different skill levels and different ages um, and just different circumstances in general, Somebody hitting a bad shot is not enough to prove negligence. Um, most of the cases that I read said if people could sue others for hitting a bad shot, no one would play golf because bad shots are completely unavoidable. I played in a golf tournament over the weekend. Just ask my dad. There were a lot of bad shots. So this is not something that can be eliminated even by the best and the worst players. And then also negligent design does not always hold up in court. So if I hit someone on an adjacent holes fairway and they sue the golf course saying that it was poorly designed, um, that's something commonly is brought to court. However, there are a lot of expert witnesses that are involved in a lot of these cases, as well as looking at the people playing in these tournaments in these rounds. So Design does not always determine whether or not, um, you know, somebody wins or loses a lawsuit. Sometimes it's discussed and sometimes it's discussed and decided completely irrelevant. But that was something that was really important that I noticed in these incidents. Resident, residence property damage, um, the sale of property and golf ball frequency was a big issue in this category. Now, I do want to mention, too, that I have some of these lawsuits um, listed under these categories. And like I said, I'm not going to go through each and every single one of them, but I wanted to note that these aren't all the lawsuits. These are just some examples. So you'll see there are a lot of these um, as we go through these subcategories. But a lot of these cases focused on um, basically realtors or people trying to sell their home um, either were dishonest about how often golf balls landed on the property um, or they just grossly underestimated. And this was a big issue. Um, so that was brought up a lot in this subcategory. And then obviously to damage resulting from mishit shots. Um, we're talking windows, doors, um, even garage doors, siding, even brick. These were all mentioned as well as things like uh, furniture outside and stuff like that, um, which is obviously part of this um, and to be expected. Injury at residence. Um, now this was um, interesting. Now I must say I'm not a homeowner, so I probably look at this um, a little bit differently, or at least I, I would think I don't in some respects, because some people had such a problem with golf balls flying into their yard when they're adjacent to the golf course that they were completely unable to use part of their yard due to the risk of injury. 
So whether that be their backyard faces a hole and they can't even barbecue during the summer without thinking they may get hit by a golf ball, um, or they don't want their kids to play in the front yard that is next to a golf course because they're afraid they'll get hit. So residents were unable to use part of their yard. Also, um, one thing that was also brought up in this category was residents that were struck outside of their condos. This was interesting too, um, because there were two cases in particular that I have here that ruled differently. Um, one of them ruled that if you live on a golf course, you're accepting the risk. If you may get hit by a golf ball, that's kind of your problem. You're choosing to live there. Whereas the other case um, was the complete opposite. So, and like I said, I'm not gonna go in depth, but that was something that was brought up in this category that was really interesting. So next we're gonna talk about patron. And like I mentioned, this subcategory emerged in every single group. And part of the reason for that is because it included spectators, pedestrians, employees, caddies and trespassers, as well as painters, roofers and contractors. So most of these um, were issues where somebody just straight up didn't see a golf ball or they weren't able to appreciate the risk. Like I have this picture of a painter here. Some of the cases were somebody painting a house next to the golf course or fixing a roof um, that don't play golf that would never even think about a golf ball coming and hitting them. That was something that was brought up in this category as well as people watching events, whether that be professional events or amateur events. So I put all of these together because they, they couldn't quite fit cleanly in the other subcategories and also I think it just made the most sense for this analysis. And then vehicle property damage. Um, vehicles were damaged at, outside of their homes while they were parked as well as cars on adjacent highways. This was something that we saw um, throughout the analysis as well as um, on adjacent roadways that like led to the golf course. So like if it's on the golf course property, but it was technically um, a city street and people would hit cars while they're driving up to the golf course, that kind of fell into this category as well. And parking lot. Now this was interesting too. There were only these two cases, I believe, um, in this subcategory, um, but this was players that were walking to and from the course. So we're talking about somebody going to play and someone that gets done playing. Now this is based on um, usually the layout of where the parking lot is in reference to like the nearest green. Um, the course that I played in college, one of the greens was right next to the parking lot and there were multiple times where I knew that cars got hit while I was there. Um, and I spent a lot of time there, so it happened frequently. Um, but I wanted to bring this up because it is a problem and a lot of people, they don't think about that. Um, and that's one of the issues that kind of surrounds all of this is a lot of these things people just don't even think about. If you just got done playing and especially if you played poorly, the last thing you're thinking about is, oh gosh, I may get hit by a golf ball. You're probably thinking about where you messed up in your round or how you want to dump all of your golf clubs in a, the nearby pond. You're probably not thinking that, oh, I need to be careful and watch so I don't get hit by a golf ball. So those were the subcategories that I looked at. And I also examined um, common legal issues that emerged. There were five that repeatedly were brought up throughout this analysis. And the first was standard of care. Next was reckless misconduct. And then duty to warn, foreseeability, and zone of risk. Now, I'm not gonna dive super deep into these either for the sake of time, because I mainly wanna mention those three that I lumped together. These were the most intertwined concepts in this study. So duty to warn, foreseeability, and zone of risk. These were the big issues that had a lot to do with each other and were brought up a lot. And I'll show you how that kind of worked. And that was because zone of risk, this idea encompasses all three of those, um, those different concepts. Because a player has the duty to warn someone when they are within their foreseeable zone of risk. So foreseeability is all about being able to essentially see that something could happen. You can expect that some, something could happen. So a player only has to tell somebody that they may be in the way 
if they, they know that they may hit it in that direction. That's essentially what this is saying. Um, and these are just some of the lawsuits that this was brought up multiple times. And again, this is within the foreseeable zone of risk, which is a very interesting concept that plays into um, my, the remainder of the analysis of this study, as well as the discussion that I'll get to. So this is a way that you can understand this, is that we're looking at the player that is the white golfer, um, the little icon, that is the person hitting the golf ball, that red shaded area. Let's say that that is their foreseeable area where they may hit the golf ball. It is expected that they will hit the golf ball in that area. <clears throat> now the yellow icon you can see is in two different places on each of these. Now on the, um, on the graphic on the left, that person is in that foreseeable zone. So the golfer that is hitting the shot has the duty to warn that person, hey, I'm going to hit a shot, or hey, you are in my way. However, in the graphic on the right, it is not the same because this player is outside of where the golfer thinks they're going to be hitting the golf ball. And like I said before, the um, hitting a bad shot in and of itself is not enough to sue somebody. So if you're outside of a player's zone of risk and you get hit by a golf ball, it was not their job to warn you because it was not expected that the golf ball would go that way. So I wanted to kind of provide this so you can get like a big picture. This is how it looks different and how those three concepts really work together. Now, something else that I wanted to touch on um, were injuries and trends. 40% of the cases occurred between different groups on different holes, like we already mentioned. Head and eye injuries were the most prominent that um, emerged in the study, which was not really a surprise. If you read any um, news reports or anything that has to do with injuries on a golf course that is like a publication or um, again, like a news report, video, almost all of them talk about a head or an eye injury. So these were the most prominent in the analysis. And on average, um, there were two cases per year throughout this um, time period. There were many years that there were not any lawsuits, uh, but on average, about two cases a year. All right, so lawsuit decisions. This is when it starts to get a little bit interesting. I mentioned I'm not gonna dive super deep into all of the decisions of every individual case, but I wanted to provide an overview. So 32 of the 85 relevant lawsuits were against a golf course. So something happened and the person that got injured sued the golf course. The injured party won 50% of the time in these issues, in these lawsuits. The, the decisions that were in favor of the course usually had to do with there was no breach of duty and there was lack of foreseeability. So somebody got hurt because they were in an area that nobody had ever even hit a golf ball before or very, very rarely. <clears throat> or the golf course didn't really have anything that they could have done or were supposed to do to um, protect that player from being hurt by an errant shot. They were already acting within their duty. They did not have to do anything additionally. And then the most common issues that were part of this were improper design as well as the creation of an unsafe condition. So the cases that um, ruled against the golf course those were the issues that they primarily ruled against. So now here's the discussion, findings and interpretations. Sorry guys, I know I'm rambling, I'm trying my best, but we all know it's a problem I have. I'm trying to <laughs> cut it down a little. Um, buffer zones would have prevented 86% of the 85 relevant lawsuits identified. So if a buffer zone would have been put in place, a lot of those would not have even been issues or would have hopefully not have even been issues. Now, I did want to mention before I get any further in talking about these lawsuits is that approximately 95% of lawsuits end in a pretrial settlement. So they don't even go to court. Um, 
so the what I am discussing, these are the lawsuits that actually went to court. This doesn't include any of the um, settlements that happened. So there may be other circumstances that um, I can't find because they settled outside of court. And the goals of my study here, big picture, were to fill a gap in the literature because it didn't exist, um, as well as provide useful information for practitioners. And so I'm hoping that the findings and interpretations that I have for you will kind of help achieve those goals, as well as answer my previous research questions. So the most common proximate cause was interactions between golfers in different groups on different holes. So I'm playing hole 11 and I hit somebody across the way on hole 16. We're not in the same group and we're not on the same hole. That was the most common proximate cause. Patrons were injured in each of the large category, or excuse me, in each large category. So we're talking about the locations, on course, off course, as, as well as course premises. Patrons were injured in all of those. And head and eye injuries were overwhelmingly the most common types of injury. Now, I wanted to break down this as well. So what I mentioned before is that part of the, the goal of doing this research is to provide something that practitioners, that head golf professionals, um, tournament directors, even instructors, people can use this information. So what I wanted to provide was kind of a number, something that is easy to understand for people that may not understand all the legal jargon. So looking at lawsuits against a course, you see that I have two different numbers here. Now, 40 total cases in my analysis. So that's 40 out of that 133 cases before I eliminated um, those other categories. 40 of those um, were against a golf course. Somebody sued the golf course because of what happened. Um, the case won in 21 of those and lost in 19 of those. 47.5% winning rate, um, or excuse me, I have those swapped. Um, I apologize. But essentially 50% almost on that. And the, the same thing kind of goes for um, buffer zones, the cases that surrounded only buffer zones, that, that um, final data set of 85, 32 of those cases were lawsuits against a course. And that also yielded a 50-50 shot. So whether we're looking at lawsuits that had very specifically a, a buffer zone could have prevented this issue or could not, regardless, a golf course essentially has a 50-50 shot that they may get in a lawsuit and lose, which is a big problem. Now, some people Whenever we talk about that, the thought may be, but people are assuming the risk of being hit by a golf ball just by being on the course. If you're playing golf, you may get hit by a golf ball and that's something that you have to accept. I'm not gonna lie, I was one of the people in this camp. I thought if you're on the golf course, you could get hit, it's part of it. But that actually is not necessarily the case. If we look at this again, we can see that assumption of risk doctrine did not um, play a big part in all of these. Um, basically, it was only brought up in these cases that I have kind of in the gray areas. So where the course won in those lawsuits, out of 21 cases, that was only the issue that was brought up in six of them. And conversely, where the course lost, only three of those cases. And that's very similar in the cases that could have been prevented by buffer zones. So by saying that somebody on a golf course is assuming the risk of being hit by golf ball, that's not always something you can rely on. Actually, very rarely, if you look at this research. So big picture, something I wanted to bring up was that if somebody sues a golf course after being hit by an errant ball, there's nearly a 50-50 chance the course will lose the case. Now, I'm gonna kind of tie it all back and remind you guys that I'm talking about recreational golf. I'm not talking about these um, high-end golf courses that make millions of dollars a year that have people like Brooks Kepka, Tom Watson, 
um, Tiger Woods that have these big name players that are members there, we're not really talking about those golf courses. We're talking about the public and the semi-private golf courses that, um, you know, they have one bad golf season, they're gonna be struggling financially. And if they have a 50-50 shot at losing a case, if they get sued, that's a big risk to them. If they can have one year of bad weather and it be a big problem, you better believe that um, one lawsuit is gonna be even more of a big problem. So that is overwhelmingly the thing that I wanna make clear here is that if you are someone that works at a golf course, you cannot be naive. If you get sued, there's only a 50-50 chance that you will win your case, which that's something, I'm not a gambling person typically, but I would not wanna bet on that. 50-50 is not a good chance. So because of that, I have some recommendations. Now, one thing that I, um, one quote that I kept coming over many times and that was in the back of my head was this one, um, carelessness on the part of the golf manager for whatever reason can and does cause accidents and injuries. So thinking back to that 50-50 shot, if I was a, a golf pro working at a golf course and I just chose to ignore that, that is so careless and I'm asking for issues. So some of the things that practitioners can do, the first is to know their clientele, know who is on their golf course. Also, also be able to identify areas where buffer zones should be located. Supervise and monitor golf course conditions, as well as make changes to the course as necessary. Now, all of these kind of play together because by knowing your clientele, you're able to identify where buffer zones should be located. And I'll, I'll show you how this all works together. Um, and by supervising and monitor monitoring course conditions and knowing your clientele, you can know what changes need to be made so that buffer zones can be properly put in place or where they should at least be. So I'm gonna show you here an example. So let's just say these, these are all, um, the same hole, but let's say they're the same hole at a different golf course. At golf course number one, let's say the majority of the customers that play there, they are relatively skilled. They hit the ball long way, um, but they typically hit it in the fairway. Now, again, there's always accidents that can happen. Somebody can't be held liable for a bad shot, but in the big scheme of things, these people are pretty skilled. So those houses that are on the left there, yeah, they should be considered, but by somebody that knows their um, clientele can probably think, okay, the likelihood of that happening um, on this specific hole may not be as big of an issue as it could be on another hole. So they need to prioritize their efforts elsewhere. Another example, let's say that the clientele at this golf course is maybe an older group um, or a less skilled group, they hit it kind of all over the place, but they can't hit it far enough to be able to hit those houses. So by knowing the clientele there, the practitioner is also able to say, okay, these don't really come into play. Again, there's always exceptions, but these houses aren't really in the way, big picture. But then you have this situation where this is kind of more of the typical recreational golfer Somebody that hits it has a high propensity for hitting it offline, especially out of bounds. Um, I just put left here, but also has the potential to hit it right as well. Um, but also you may have a huge group of people that can hit it a long way. So the recreational golf sector that encompasses a lot of these people, those houses may be in direct line of being hit every single day by people on that golf course. So that information alone can provide practitioners an understanding of not only where they should prioritize their money if they have to put in buffer zones somewhere, but also um, you know, who their clients are can help shape not only how you manage risk, but also just be a better manager. So let's look here at how this actually works, what this looks like. So again, we're looking at the, the hole on the far right. Let's, here are some things that 
practitioners can actually do, some changes that can be made. Maybe they wanna plant a couple trees. So that's a buffer that you don't have to really change the integrity of the whole. You don't have to move houses. You just put in some trees. It can act as a buffer. Maybe put up a fence. Not as aesthetically pleasing, but also an option. Another thing you could even do is just move the pin location. Move it to an area where a golfer may not be trying to hit um, the same shot. They may subconsciously be able to hit it another direction because they're trying to go in a certain direction. You could even do things like add some bunkers. So um, consciously and subconsciously, players are more likely to hit another direction. Those are some changes that in the big scheme of things are not that big, especially if you're comparing it to completely redoing a hole. And so by putting in some of these buffers, you can hopefully redirect some of that traffic um, to another part of the hole. Now again, there's always exceptions, but this is kind of what um, my recommendations kind of show, what I'm hoping to convey. So I'm gonna conclude, which you guys are probably all like, thank goodness, we're sick of hearing this girl talk, but we're going to conclude here by saying what exactly this means for buffer zones. Remember, buffer zones, um, they're not a one-size-fits-all thing, and they also can't always be created. So looking at that previous example with the different holes, you can't just ask someone to up and move their whole house. But you can do things like implement some of those safety buffers, like the, um, the bunkers, the trees, the fence, that kind of thing. Now, this is a big deal for buffer zones in golf because golf specific risk management research is limited in general. And I'm the first person to ever do any golf buffer zone research. So that tells you this is extremely limited. This is something that needs to be explored more. We need to have more follow up research. We could do quantitative as well as qualitative research. What I originally was going to do for my dissertation or part of it was going to be <clears throat> excuse me, analyzing where golf balls land. Wasn't able to do that because of the virus. It was going to be a field study, but that's something that I can do later on as a follow-up to these results. And then lastly, collaboration could lead to industry-wide buffer zone recommendations. Now, collaboration would be between like these governing bodies, so like USGA, PGA, as well as um, practitioners, so golf managers, head professionals, and buffer zone experts. Um, and I wanna make a point to say right now that um, I, my, my kind of, one of my emphasis areas, for those of you that don't know what a cognate is, is public policy. And so I kind of think of these things while I'm putting this stuff together and that this collaboration and trying to create a policy, that's not feasible. You can't tell every golf course how they should set up their layout, but you can provide recommendations and putting these um, groups together, getting these people together is a good way to start that. So basically, I'm going to leave you with the idea of a golf course has a 50-50 shot at winning a lawsuit. Not very good chances, but we could get the right people together that might be able to remedy that a little bit that may be able to help that situation. And not only make golf safer, but in turn also encourage more people to play because they don't have to worry where their golf ball's going all the time. So that's basically it, what I have for you for buffer zones within the golf industry and my research that I did. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to um, you know, take this time out of the middle of your day. Um, but I do want to open up the floor um, for questions. First off, um, for my committee, let me figure out how I can um, get, okay, there we go, get away from this. Um, but first, again, I want to open up the floor for anyone that may have questions, but first for my committee. You did this all on first shot or um because your recommendation for practitioner and you show this short shot for the old people mm -hmm. um 
if they were then sitting in the middle of the fairway, wouldn't there be a second shot that might go into those houses? Yes, and um, with those graphics, I was mainly just trying to demonstrate um, how by knowing who your customers are, you can gain like some sort of um, like insight. Um, and obviously there are going to be second shots and third shots and for a lot of people way more shots after that. Um, but big picture by knowing who your clients are, who your customers are, you can get an idea of where those shots may be or at least the general trends, which is just kind of what I was hoping to convey by showing those graphics. Natalie, do you see that the average club pro mm -hmm. um, could take your information and actually implement some of those changes? Or do you foresee this as something that you, as somebody that has studied this, would have to be a consultant for them? Um, I selfishly, I hope I could be a consultant because that would really help me out. <laughs> um, but honestly, it's kind of a gray area type of answer, unfortunately, because within the recreational sector, you have some public courses that are big money and they, they have a risk management team. So they could read this and say, okay, we really need to look into this. Whereas like my home golf course, and this isn't a slam on them, but they don't have the means to be able to probably even take the time to read this and understand this, but also to implement it. So it's kind of that balance in hopefully by providing that general information um, and helping me get a job, like I said, that would be okay. I wouldn't mind that. Um, but by also hopefully getting these governing bodies to make it, um, more of something that's recognized so that these littler golf courses for lack of a better phrase maybe they could get some help with this issue by some of these bodies if they could come with some committee or something where these people can look at these golf courses now that's a utopian view obviously but um, to answer your question I hate to say it but it just kind of depends it depends on so many circumstances but I would hope the general information would at least be helpful to help some of these managers at least come up with some sort of strategy. Yeah, I have, a, I have, a, yeah, I have a related question. So uh, this is Gobu. Mm -hmm. So it seems like the proposal is a great idea to mitigate those potential risks, right? And mm -hmm. um, but the question is really, well, so maybe what you are saying is that they are lacking sort of awareness of this important issue and a tool. But then I, I want to push out a bit further. So why don't they have this great uh, sort of design component of the golf course to mitigate this risk in the golf course right now? Are there any sort of politics going on or they, they uh, weigh more in other um, values than uh, mitigate risk or have ever thought about it? Um, that's a really good question, and that that's something that I have thought about. Um, and again, I hate to I hate to be so vague, but it's another thing that kind of just depends on the golf course, um, mm. mainly because, like, again, I think of my home golf course. We're a semi-private golf course, relatively small in the big scheme of things, and they barely have enough staff to just do the day-to-day -day operations. So this is kind of like not even on their radar. Whereas if there was some committee or group or heck, even a document that could really show them that this is a problem, it might be something to prioritize. Um, but I think unfortunately, um, a lot of golf courses and some of these governing bodies, <clears throat> they're trying to keep golf not only afloat because golf is relatively unstable um, in comparison to other sports, it's getting better, judging by all of the reports I've read as far as growth of the game. Um, but they're, they're trying to make money at the end of the day. And if they have to prioritize getting more people to play in their tournament rather than rearranging their golf course, um, they're probably gonna focus on the tournament. Whereas on the other hand, 
some of these larger, more prestigious golf courses, there are politics that are involved. And I could see where having these, um, these groups come together, that there could be some issues between the groups, like maybe the PGA and the USGA, they don't wanna work together. I don't know if that's the case, but there are always underlying politics, it seems like in those things. Um, and just the same as if you have a very prestigious golf course, um, the USGA may be less likely to really push that golf course to do something because maybe they have a lot of USGA tournaments there that are very successful. It's kind of this shared mutual benefit. So there's this really kind of like delicate situation there. Um, and I, I wish I had an answer and that's something I would like to dive deeper in. But unfortunately, I think it's just a lot of these things that kind of just depends on the course or having the right people to go to these courses and identify them. Natalie, you may have earlier hit on one of the other things is the awareness and education. You as a lifelong golfer still had kind of the view of, well, if you're going to be around a golf course, it's your responsibility to know this mm -hmm. versus trying to make them aware that 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 I guess for a lot of people, a lifelong view of what it is, that it's not how the courts view it and it's not realistic for everybody mm -hmm. that's coming to a golf course. Yeah, and that's one thing, like the very first thing you learn as a junior golfer is to get out of the way. Don't get hit by somebody's golf ball or golf club. That's the first thing you learn. But you know, if you don't learn how to play golf till you're 50, for instance, um, and you've never played a sport in your life, that may not be your first thought. You may be so focused on just trying to hit the golf ball that you're not even paying attention to what's around you. Um, and I think that that's something too, that if this was more, if, if this issue was brought up more in awareness to any anybody in the golf industry, um, I think that that would improve those kind of like norms and values for everybody. And I think that also a big issue right now is pace of play. Um, the USGA is pushing the let's play faster, let's play faster. And I think by bringing awareness to those these issues, I think it could increase pace of play. You come up with a system where people um, know where safe areas to stand or something are, um, they're more likely to try to hit it to those areas subconsciously. There's always bad shots. But I think one of the issues that may be a reason why this isn't explored anymore is because they're, they're focusing so much on pace of play. It wouldn't surprise me if they thought, well, this is important, but if people play fast, it's not going to be that big of an issue. Or let's get more people playing. Let's ignore this problem. I have a very quick uh, methodology question. So I really enjoy um, reading your content analysis, result interpretation, and so on and so on. Thanks. Um, and I think it's very uh, rigorously done. So that's great. The one quick question is that, so you, you, you know, kind of reduce the case from 1561 to 85. Also, you did the content analysis, I, I assume, manually by yourself. Mm -hmm. um, did you have any sort of cross validation of your case selection and then the content analysis? Because usually, maybe this will be different tradition, but in social science in general, they usually report those things a little bit, like coins, kappa measure to, we call it intercode reliability. So for example, other researcher might have a little bit different analytical result. Uh, when they looked at the exactly same cases and uh, content, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I, I wonder if you uh, implemented those those things a little bit. Um, I have. Oh, is this, yeah, this is this is solely done by you, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Yes, and that's that's one um, kind of problem, but also selfishly, is kind of cool about doing this. I'm the only person that's ever done this. And so there's no existing research for me to really compare it to. Um, so as far as that's concerned, that was something I couldn't really do, um, or at least that I even 
thought was possible that I could do. Um, but also on the other side, when I was going through these lawsuits, if, if it talked about another case, another case was referenced, um, and it was one that I knew that I hadn't read, I would go back and make sure it wasn't one that was supposed to be in there. Um, because there are multiple times I would talk about all of these other golf related cases, but that didn't fit. They were outside of the scope of the study, but that was one thing that I did make a point to do that if it brought up any case about golf or that seemed potentially relevant, I checked those out to make sure that I wasn't forgetting anything. Very good. Hey, Natalie, it's, it's Josh. Um, in your dissertation, you have a couple different statistics. I'm just curious how you arrived at them. And they're both pretty startling statistics where you say a proper buffer zone would have protected against damages in 86% of identified rel relevant cases. And then when you break down the cases a little bit more, you also have 82% um, could have been prevented had proper bu buffer zones been in place. How do you come up with those numbers? Um, so the 86, um, without looking at it to make sure I'm telling you the right thing, I, I believe the 86 was looking at that 133 and that 85 possibly. Um, I'd have to look at the numbers and where they're at to give you a for sure 100% honest answer. Um, but one thing that I did notice as I was preparing to present that some of those statistics were kind of muddy the way that I described them. And I think I could have um, made that a little more clear in the document. So I do apologize for that. Um, but specifically what I was trying to eliminate was the 133 cases included some that did not have anything that buffer zones could have fixed. So then that's how I narrowed it down to that 85. And then when I started talking about that, um, the statistics of the 40 cases versus the 32 cases, um, to kind of put it plainly, that 40 cases was kind of similar to that 133. It kind of talked about a little bit of everything that was still kind of within the larger scope of the study, whereas that 32 um, was, okay, buffer zones really could have fixed this. Um, and the 85 and the 82%, I'd have to go back and look at it to give you the for sure answer. But like I said, I know for publishing this, I'm going to have to kind of clean that up. Um, but I hope that that somewhat answers your question. <laughs> Yeah, it um, seems like you could um, put 82 to 85 percent and then you wouldn't have the two conflicting with each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, more intrinsic issue in terms of analysis is that, like I said, some sort of, uh, sort of cross validation of your sort of subjective judgment on those numbers. Mm -hmm. but, but I, I think that the way I interpret um, the question that you just got is that you know, there are a lot of other factors that influences win and loss in a lawsuit. And what you are arguing is that purple zone is the critical, right? Mm -hmm. Because of that can prevent. But you know, you, you can think about other factors that also have an impact on win and loss of any kind of lawsuit, right? So um, from um, the reader's perspective of your work, uh, they might want to know uh, where, how those numbers come from uh, while controlling for other compounding factors that have an impact on your, the result of your loss, right? So, yeah, that, that can be a little bit uh, specified and elaborated, I think. Okay. I have a big question. I'm sorry, I, I, it's, I, it's so interesting research. So um, I learned a lot throughout the process. And then I, um, 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 I was part of this committee and a uh, great research idea for uh, dissertation uh, prospect defense and, and so on and so on. And so I, I observed this evolution of your research agenda, which you and I now finalized and, and presented today. 
But what are the limitations to research you already mentioned a little bit? And how do you improve uh, your research if you, uh, say, awarded $1 million research grant? So um, I just want to make sure I answer the right question. Are you, are you saying, so say I got a research grant, how would I follow up this research? Right. Or if, uh, if you can improve your current research, why would you do that with that money? Um, well, I can immediately think of ways that I could follow this research. One would be to do the field study that I originally was going to do and just see if, if I can put all of it together to come up with something that's more concrete um, and more of like a quantitative um, number, more numbers to it that make a little bit more sense than just talking about these cases. So that's one thing. Um, and then also I think it would be really interesting to follow up with some sort of qualitative component of talking with um, golf managers. And because I'm sure that there are so many that probably don't even think about this thing. And it's not because they, they lack the skill or the understanding. I think it's just they're so overwhelmed with everything else. Um, and so I think both of those components would be very valuable and especially looking at different golf courses and looking into some of the things like that we had just talked about like maybe seeing if there are any political issues that do come up or anything like that um, as far as improving what i have now and um, kind of looking at it in a way to make it more um, I don't, I don't know how to say what I'm trying to say, but that's a good question. I'm not sure. Um, Westlaw is a really reputable program and database, but I don't know if it would be something where I could try to get access to maybe information about settlements and see if some of those things come up with that and kind of compare. Um, and I don't, I don't know um, legally what I can even have access to. Um, but that's one thing that I automatically think of. Um, and then also another would be to maybe dig deeper into some of those um, other issues that are brought up, um, specifically like legal topics or like norms that may have brought up maybe to really dive more into that rather than providing a general understanding. Thank you, very mm -hmm. good. With that, are there anybody else who's listening like to ask any questions? Okay, so we would um, like any of you to, uh, all of you that are not on the committee to say goodbye. Okay, so if you made it this far, at this point, they asked everybody to leave. They talked to me for a couple more minutes and then they asked me to leave as well. And so essentially they asked me to leave and that's when they, my committee, all discussed um, my dissertation and any changes they thought I needed to make um, and ultimately decide whether or not I become Dr. Natalie Bird. <clears throat> Sounds very simple and it kind of is, but it's not at the same time. It's very strange. But so they talked for about 10 minutes and then they had me come back and they told me, hey, congrats, you are Dr. Natalie Bird. Um, it's never going to get old, but also it's still so surreal. I don't know if it's always going to feel this surreal, but that's just where I'm at. But anyway, um, so yeah, I have to make some revisions to my dissertation, um, which, which I'll do and get it done quickly. Um, but anyway, I'm rambling because I'm running on three hours of sleep and I'm just still overwhelmed. Like this has just been the craziest thing ever. But Again, if you made it this far, I want to give you my most genuine and sincerest thank you because if you've watched all of this, then chances are you're somebody that has really been there for me throughout the last three years. Um, 
this has been the most life altering experience ever. Um, one of the best experiences, but also the hardest thing I have ever done. And so if you've watched it to this point, then I know you're one of the people probably that stuck with me and supported me and encouraged me. And so I just want to say I genuinely appreciate you and I could not have done it without everybody's encouragement. So thank you. But anyway, I'm going to end my sappy thing because we all know that's not my style, but um, things should be returning to normal over here. I've got a lot of fun videos coming up that you're not going to want to miss. So go ahead and hit the subscribe button, like this video if you enjoyed it, leave some comments, whatever you want to do. But until next time, I'm wishing you birdies and fairways and hope you have a great day. Bye.